Hi, I'm Stan Schultes. I'm with Spark Growth, a local boutique innovation firm and innovation consultant. And most of my background is actually, my uh, corporate background has been in, in the manufacturing sector. So uh, I really appreciated your talk today, uh, showing a lot of data. Data is a good thing in, in, in manufacturing and in the economy, of course. Um, so I had some questions for you that I think, uh, I think would be relevant. I'm going to start out kind of from a technology standpoint. Um, you know, there's, a, there's been this kind of a long-term trend, I don't know, over several decades, I think, of pushing jobs, manufacturing jobs in particular, away from the U.S. because we were becoming, there were places that were much cheaper than mm -hmm. here. Um, is that still happening? Is the trend now that jobs may be coming back? I know one of the statistics that you mentioned was that we're now one of the lowest cost manufacturers in the world. So, I think this this outsourcing story mm -hmm. uh, was a bit overblown. Mm -hmm. um, that I think uh, the Did, long term trend didn't work as well as people thought it was. Well, going. but I mean, I think overblown in terms of I think the, the numbers that some people talked about. Uh, you know, when they saw uh, losses of employment, I think some of that uh, employment decline was due to us being more efficient and more effective mm -hmm. uh, at what we do called productivity has been going on for decades mm -hmm. and you know there has been little growth with regard to uh, employment for a long time even before some of this globalization um, so we saw the the, the, the the kind of the peak of employment was in that mid 1970s and mm -hmm. it was the introduction of uh, CNC, the computer numerical control manufacturing that came in, that really began to allow firms to produce a lot more uh, with the need of having fewer workers. And the type of worker uh, skill set really Shift, changed. Shifting the skill set. Um, yeah. It, it, so, for example, I mean, I remember working at my father's factory in Brooklyn, New York, uh, when I was a, a teenager back in the mid '70s, and you know, you'd see your 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 tool and die. Uh, professional. In fact, I was running a Bridgeport milling machine trying to learn a little bit of those skills and yeah. bringing the cutting tool in too quickly and yeah. smashing that carbide uh, <laughs> cutting tool and costing the company Crashing some, the tool. <laughs> some, 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 some real problems. Uh, and, and, and so, but you watch those and those are real artisans. Craftsmen, yeah. Craftsmen. True craftsmen. Where they, and then they would pick the gauging tools to measure and look at the blueprints and, you know, those jobs are few and far now between. Now you pack today. a laser up and <laughs> now you know, have to program into that uh, device as, mm -hmm. as now uh, it's a whole different skill set, um, and and so you need the computer training and how to uh, know how to operate that machine, and, uh, and increasingly it's becoming uh, more and more sophisticated. Uh, and it, I mean, I've even heard stories recently of a of a company that had bought such a machine that was so sophisticated. Their workers couldn't even operate it, uh, and it was crashing. They actually sent the machine back to get one level lower. Detuned. <laughs> so because every crash was like twenty-five grand, they oh were boy. explaining to me, and it was just it was just killing them. So they they could not get their workers to that level to operate it effectively. Mm -hmm. So they actually brought down their productivity on that uh, to some degree. So I noticed also, having worked in factories, that some of the you know reorganization of the workspace into work cells and, and finding right. ways of doing things more efficiently, even in, inside the, the workspaces themselves, also tend to shift the, uh, uh, the job content. People are able to run multiple machines now instead of multiple people per machine, yeah. it's multiple machines per people. That reminds me yeah. of, a, of a wonderful story where we had a, 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 a manufacturing conference about 15 years ago and we had a, uh, one of our speakers was a woman who was uh, owned a, a manufacturing shop and was telling sure. a story on how uh, she was trying to introduce some of this labor uh, enhancing technology and you know back then you had your Bridgeport milling machine mm -hmm. and that was your machine and you yep. could maintain it and, yep. and all of a sudden you know they start bringing in these technologies and so now it's one person is running this one machine. Mm -hmm. Well, then she noticed the fact that when the machine was running, this person was just kind of standing around watching right. the machine run. Right. So she said, hmm, I can double productivity by just bringing in another machine and told the fellow, when you're running this machine, uh, set it up fine, push the button, let it go, then set up the other one. He said, mm -hmm. like, resisted, no. no. This is my machine. This is how I always <laughs> did things, but I'm not gonna run another machine. She goes, well, I know that you, you, your wife, she's a great cook, and, and I know when she prepares a nice meal for you, 
at the end of the meal, you help her, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, I clean off the table, I load the dishwasher, and, you know, and, and take care of that. She goes, and when you push the start on the dishwasher, do you stand around watching the dishwasher run, or do you go do something else, watch television and so forth? And you can see the light bulb go off in his head that he lost this <laughs> argument. And she goes, I want you to treat this machine like a dishwasher. Once you awesome. start it, you got time, go set up the other machine, awesome. and she doubled productivity. Awesome. That's, that's the kind of story that, that you hear over and over in, in the American manufacturing story, you know, over long, long periods of time. And, and now, of course, you mentioned increasing automation starting in the mid-70s. That's been certainly one of the strongest trends in American manufacturing. What about the future of automation? How so I think we had a, we've had a tough 10 years, mm -hmm. um, you know, following the, the Great Recession, mm -hmm. uh, we had a, a, you know, a tremendous uh, loss of, of, of jobs. Um, nationally, 8.7 million workers lost their jobs, 2.3 million out of manufacturing, so a quarter of those people and lost a decrease their jobs. in productivity at the same time. Right. And because you had a whole, well, uh, you lost all these people, and, and, and so when business started to come back, uh, we had a, this complete oversupply of labor, mm -hmm. and businesses said, okay, I'll start hiring workers. Mm -hmm. And the growth rate in the economy, while decent, was not impressive. This has been the slowest recovery that we have seen in the U.S. since the Great Depression. Um, and so, to meet this modest growing economy, you could do it primarily just from hiring labor, which mm -hmm. was in plentiful supply. Um, Prices for that labor was relatively low. Wages did not rise very rapidly. And it's a safer bet because so many people coming out of the Great Recession were, are we gonna double dip? You know, Are we going to see another problem someplace else in the world? So there was a hesitation to buy a piece of equipment, which- So it's trading know, labor for capital investment. The labor the capital uh, yeah. rate changed. And, and it kept going until a few years ago, where ever increasingly you started hearing from manufacturers that we can't find qualified labor. Right. Uh, and yet business was still growing, and therefore they were kind of forced to make the capital yeah. investment. Go but, back over, to but, but over this period, uh, because capital is such an important component of productivity, productivity growth suffered mm -hmm. in manufacturing. Uh, and, and hence wages also suffered because they weren't delivering that productivity because right. they didn't have the tools. That equation now is flipping. We're seeing a lot more capital investment over the last couple of years. I think that has already brought back some productivity gains that are more in line with historical averages. And if anything, I'm optimistic that that will continue with the amount of strong capital investment to move even higher. Mm -hmm. So even though wages are starting to, to move, continue to move higher, the productivity gains have more than offset that wage gains. Mm -hmm. So unit labor costs, have actually been increasing at a slower pace okay. than we've seen in the past. Uh, well. And that, then therefore profitability remains solid, which will allow firms to continue making investments in capital. So it's, it's a really good story down the road. So one of the trends that uh, I've seen in the industry and innovation space um, is uh, a trend toward not so much automation in terms of equipment and, and you know, R&D and, and making things better, but it's been in data and analytics and artificial intelligence, right. is this perhaps one of the places where we're going to get some of this growth in the future? That is, is, what, do you, what do you think about it? Is this, I, is this a bright spot? It's a bright spot and it's a scary spot. <laughs> um, uh, scary in the, t in the sense that the concern is that if it happens too quickly, mm -hmm. Uh, will people be able to respond quickly enough and get the training in the set in the fields that they need to get involved in? Uh, another story that kind of is a sad story. Uh, it, it, you know, when, during the Great Recession, I knew a number of individuals who lost their jobs, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, they were like thinking, "I'm going to get my job back." Typical recession is a year. I'll kind of wait for that job to call me sure. back in, or I'll find some. Never and it, happened. And it just took long and long and and finally you know after three or four years they realized that uh you know this is a real problem and they're like if i had known that it was going to take me this long to find something three years earlier i would have gone and gotten retrained in something else right uh and 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 so 
if technology comes in, I think in general we've always been able to see us reinvent our workforce and to grow the number of jobs, right? Uh, employment today in the United States is higher than it's ever, mm -hmm. ever been. Mm -hmm. We always seem to be able to find good jobs and, you know, and not so good jobs, but we generally see an uptick in terms of standards of living mm -hmm. over time because of this productivity improvement. Um, so the question is, if it comes in too quickly, could that be too disruptive that we wind up having people who are not able to be as productive in the economy as they otherwise would? Mm -hmm. That being said, uh, I think the what AI offers up, artificial intelligence, autonomous type of technologies, uh, robotics, and so forth, is a very bright future. Mm -hmm. Uh, that doesn't it doesn't scare me it, I think it's going to be a great opportunity for us um, it just needs to you know kind of make sure if I can let me just talk about autonomous vehicles because sure. I spend a lot of time focusing on the automotive one side. of my favorite subjects too. Um, <laughs> you know there was a conference that just took place recently out in Asia where they brought in all these experts working on autonomous technology for vehicles and it was like well when do they actually hit the road and right. these experts uh, <laughs> you know I just monitor the field these are actually people working in the field trying mm -hmm. to figure out when their stuff is gonna be usable some people said 2023 so five years out others said 2035 mm -hmm. so it's still a very <laughs> wide range there and uh, um, um, that being said, it wasn't like anybody said it's never going to happen. So right. it's it, it is coming, and it, and I think one thing you have to appreciate is that it's not going to be like one day we wake up and we have autonomous vehicles driving us. Right. Um, we're seeing the technology already work its way into the product mix, and if anything, working its way into the product mix faster than in the past. Mm -hmm. In the past, new technology would come for the luxury vehicles, and then after time, it would work sure. its way down. Now you bring the technology out, and it goes across the spectrum of all the cars that they have. Adaptive cruise control as one, lane guidance uh, warnings, mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. These are all parts of technology that's gonna be needed for autonomous vehicles. But when we get full autonomous type of technology, it could be extremely game-changing if it becomes very clear that this is a much safer way of going from point A to point B. We've yeah. seen highway deaths yeah. actually rise, and, and so much of it is, is people being distracted. Uh, and, oh yeah, and texting while driving. Texting while mm -hmm. driving, uh, or being intoxicated, mm -hmm. or on, on, on drugs and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. All that stuff becomes a non-issue once you have autonomous vehicles that can safely do that. So if in fact we start to find out that uh, autonomous vehicles are safer, and how will we find that out? Well, when we start getting some of these autonomous vehicles, the question is, we've got a whole industry devoted to that, mm -hmm. called the insurance industry. Of course. And if you have one of these vehicles and the insurance rates are substantially cheaper, well, it's in part because there's less likely to have these issues. Sure. So if there, but it, it, it's gonna trans, it could be very transformative with the way we organize our activity. From everywhere from cities that if people all of a sudden are getting these autonomous vehicles um, uh, you're not going to need as many repair shops you mm -hmm. probably won't need as many emergency room visits uh, uh, people won't be getting maimed uh, not let, let alone killed but they won't even be maimed mm -hmm. by, uh, so you won't need as, as, as many uh, you know people in the in the rehab uh, field um, uh, so another shift I hope it, it could be whole another shift and then we're not even talking about the Uber and, and Lyft kind of phenomena Bus of ride or, sharing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so if, if they could be displaced out of those positions. Mm -hmm. And if people are, in fact, if Uber can now send you an autonomous vehicle to take you from point A to point B, and they can do it so much less expensively than, say, owning a vehicle, mm -hmm. maybe you stop buying vehicles. It's and an, just get that service. I don't think most people know what a vehicle actually costs them every year. Yeah. Um, you know, to by the time you, you buy the vehicle and pay the, the interest rate on your and on your loan and, and, and the insurance and the if gas price. If you're and in the, the city, you've got you've got to store the vehicle. Parking, yeah. Parking it. Um, yeah. And and so uh, and we're starting to see, in fact, one parking garage in downtown Chicago is taken down, and they're putting up an office building. Mm -hmm. I, I want to talk mm -hmm. to the developer there to say, <laughs> did you kind of maybe think that? the future of parking garages might be on its way out if in fact people are yeah. Ubering or, or, or getting ride services sure. uh, rather than driving their vehicle downtown. Uh, and then 
if people aren't owning vehicles, do you need as many requirements to build garages right. as, as in the past? Uh, Same with parking spaces along streets. Exactly. You know, they're, they're being transformed already in, in city downtowns right. and in, if, into urban if, spaces. Right, and if you, if you say the fact that, okay, you, you're not going to allow parking on the streets, now mm -hmm. you've just doubled the capacity of a one two-lane road in the thing. All of a sudden it becomes a four-lane and, mm -hmm. and traffic flow, so it improves congestion flow. Sure. Uh, so it could be very game-changing. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I'm getting into. I get very excited when I think about the transformative nature of some of these technologies, not just on uh, our ability of producing more, but how they can really improve the, the lives of our citizens. You know, it's, it's a, I work in the smart city space, and this is one of the conversations we have a lot. Transportation is, is a huge deal. Uh, actually, maybe we should call it mobility rather right. than transportation. Ab absolutely. Mobility encompasses a lot more. Uh, you know, the, the whole idea of end-to-end, -end, um, you know, you, you've got to get from somewhere to somewhere else. How are you going to do that? There's, uh, you know, probably in the future there'll be a much more of a mix of you know, rather than getting in your own car, um, you know, the, the use of different modes of transportation, multimodal transportation will become more and more important, uh, especially in places like uh, Tampa, you know, where we are in the Tampa Bay region, uh, kind of built around the car. We don't have a successful mass transit system here. Right. It's going to be much more multimodal. Right. So this this is something that we could go on and on about, but but when I think about automation and autonomous vehicles too, you look at, I recently looked at a video of, a, of an Amazon plant. You know, there's more robots running around yes, these plants I than there are people, of course. You know, the one in Seattle. It's, yeah, these, it's these autonomous robots are, you know, it's incredible. And we're learning a lot from, from, you know, building those and bringing that to the road. I was just in Las Vegas riding an autonomous, both a shuttle and um, a self-driving car. And, you know, it's, it's a little unnerving the first time when the driver, you know, you start and he sits back and you're going right into traffic and, uh, you know, now you've got, you know, of course traffic is chaotic in a city, right. in a place like Las Vegas on the Strip. Yes. You know, people aren't from there and, and, and you know, I happen to know the people who, who work on the transportation systems in Orlando too. Orlando is another one of those cities where you've got a lot of people coming from a lot of other places that don't necessarily know where they're going at the moment. You know, right. the, you know they're, they're in an unfamiliar place and the, the use of autonomous vehicles is going to help those kinds of situations dramatically and, and lower pedestrian deaths and, and you know bicyclist deaths and things like that too. So you said something a few minutes ago that actually was a, a nice um, segue to what I wanted to ask you next, which was uh, when people lost their jobs in the last downturn, they didn't think it was going to be as long before the next upturn and maybe they could have gotten some retrainer or something. So. One of the other big trends that's happening in the economy now is this sort of a shift to the gig economy, right. you know, where it's more independent workers, people who don't work for a big company. How is this going to affect manufacturing? Well, uh, is it going to affect manufacturing? I, Can it affect? So <laughs> it, it, it has the it has the opportunity of affecting it. Um, uh, in particular, you I'm hearing from some of our manufacturers that the younger workforce has different priorities mm -hmm. than. Uh, uh, than the traditional workforce, um, where they want more flexibility mm -hmm. of taking time off to pursue uh, this or that, and and so, um, uh, it, which is a tough thing for a manufacturer who has to have scheduled work to get done, right. and they've got to have people there. So um, it, it's been a real challenge for for uh, manufacturers to try to try to work around. Um, you know, and the gig economy is uh, r really. Uh, has some benefits and some concerns. I think some of the benefits are that there's a whole lot of people out there who can't dedicate a certain time uh, mm. to be at work every single day. Right. Um, so even if you're talking about a relatively low skilled worker, say they want to work at a fast food joint, well, they want you to be there from nine to three on this shift, and and, mm -hmm. and you've got to be you got to be there because nobody else can cover that shift. Right. And whereas the you know if if you have more of a gig type of job, driving for Uber as one example, mm -hmm. you know you set your own hours. Sure. Um, so this is really good if you've got uh, you know a young mother who has kids at school and she wants to be home for, with them, well, when they're at school, she can go and do these type of jobs. Or if you're caregiving for a relative and, you know, you need to take them to a doctor's appointment uh, to, you know, help them so out. So it might be additive to what you do 
you exactly. as so your main. Exactly. So I think that has the opportunity of bringing in a mm -hmm. lot of people that previously were not able to participate. Uh -huh. uh, or, you know, somebody who is uh, retired, mm -hmm. who just wants to work a few hours, they can just, you know, become, and I've, I've met, you know, several, you know, drivers who are doing just that mm -hmm. uh, with Uber, they're retired. And it's a way of them to be socially active. They tell me, you know, talking to people, they tend to be the, the ones who are more talkative when they're driving you around. Well, what about what about people who are retired maybe coming back to the to the in-office workforce part-time you know these are folks who have Absolutely. tremendous amounts of experience and and uh, and background in what they're doing traditionally you know companies like manufacturing companies it's a full-time job you are there between the hours right. of and, and it's not so much a part-time or a or a gig sort of work do you see any sort of trends? Oh, we are. Way? We absolutely are. Uh, so when you when you're working later in life, and yes, I mean, uh, so for, I think for several reasons. Um, so when when you look at the labor statistics, uh, the fastest growing uh, age group are those baby boomers who are, who are already retired. retiring. <laughs> uh, well, and we still got ten more years to go. Sure. When you think about the yeah. fact that uh, the baby boom generation ended what around 63, 64. Mm -hmm. so the youngest of that cohort is still you know fifty four, fifty five years of age. Uh, so if you think about the traditional 65. I'm, I'm right on the tail of that myself. <laughs> uh, so you've got 10 more years before you kind of hit that 65. Yep. Yep. And then on top of that, uh, up until recently, and some people suggest that the opioid crisis is playing a role in that, we had been witnessing that every decade we were adding about three years to life expectancy. Mm -hmm. It seems to have flattened out of late, and again, some people have... Uh, made the statement that it could be that the, some of the opioid issues are actually uh, keeping those gains from well, so a lot of those deaths are happening in younger people though I think perhaps well, but, the older people are actually living a little longer and, and, and the statistics and, and, are just pulling them down and it could be and it could be um, uh, that being said we are seeing when you break out the uh, labor force participation by age cohorts uh, the older workers are actually increasing Jumping, their participation yeah. mm. uh, now still those uh, over the age of, of, of 65 still represent just a little over 19% mm -hmm. of the workforce. So um, it's it's still one out of every five workers. But it's been rising over time. Mm -hmm. Not more, you know, this mm -hmm. is a, a long-term trend. Part of that is the fact that, you know, people are living longer. Yeah. So, you know, when back in the day, you know, if you were retired at 65, but you were going to be dead at 75, you just have to plan for 10 years to finance a retirement. If you're living now closer to 80, that's yeah. five more years. Right. And so you either have to save more or work a little longer. Sure. So I think yeah. some of that is that people realizing that they have to cover a longer time period for life uh, might delay that. Finally, I would just say more recently, it's uh, those baby boomers who maybe were on the leading edge of retirement got really hammered during the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, the last 10 years, you know, they especially during the downturn, they might have had a lot of invested in their homes, which lost value. Equity markets, they, they took a hit there. Businesses were cutting back on their 401k contributions, mm -hmm. uh, people's bonuses were cut back. Mm -hmm. Maybe you had planned on, you know, once I turned 50, I was going to save aggressively. Well, they might have lost their job as well. So people, uh, especially approaching those retirement years, probably took a big financial hit. Right. Uh, clearly working a few more years is, is, is one way of resolving that. That's right. a few more years that you won't be having to cover with your savings, uh, and plus you're able to put away some more money over that period. So some of this might be more temporary related to the financial crisis, mm -hmm. but in general these are trends which, because of longevity, uh, have been increasing. Yeah, you know, better health as you get older and um, you know, people exercise more, eat better. Uh, working in the entrepreneur uh, ecosystem development space, uh, we, we like to laugh and say, so you can only golf and fish so much before you, you, before you, you and, find that th there's, there's got to be something that's a little bit more engaging for you and you know your mind is still active you want to be out there working. right and, and don't forget so the fact that there's been a, a real benefit to the fact that uh, you know while we might regret the fact that the manufacturing share of our workforce has gone down uh, working in a manufacturing environment is not easy it's very right. you know in, in terms of what it does to your body you're on your feet all day uh, moving material around and, uh, and, and you know 
and there, and so, and for example, it's a reason why you want to have these kind of mandatory retirement ages for firemen, right? You don't oh, yeah. want a seventy-year-old fireman coming <laughs> in to try to carry you out. Right. Um, so uh, similarly, I think the fact that uh, you know over eighty, well over eighty percent of our economy now is a service economy. Mm-hmm. That means that as long as you have your brain still working, you can be very productive. And so even if your kind of motor skills are slowing down or your body is, you can still do the job fairly effectively. And again, the fact that the work has in general not been a very stressful kind of physical labor for most of your career, your body probably is in better shape than somebody who has been doing more physical type of work, say construction and so forth. Sure, of course the knowledge base workers isn't so much about being physical, you know, your, your brain is engaged and, right. and you can do that much longer you know, right. if you right. can keep up with the technology. And that's, that's <laughs> absolutely right. <laughs> Which at some point, uh, you know, faces all of us who work in technology is, a, is something that happens. Right. So let me shift to a little bit more global view of, of, of what's going on in the world right now. So, and, and maybe some of the more controversial things that, that uh, are happening in today's world. So there's this apparent well, it depends on who you who you ask, who you talk to. This apparent impending implosion of China. You know that, that you know if you look at at the investments that they make in in America in businesses and land, it's dropped tenfold in the last year. Okay. okay. I mean, there's there's some really amazing things, and if you look at some of the other trends, um, you know, is is what's really going on there? Is it um, you know they're reducing investment in the U.S. How is this going to potentially affect us in the U.S. And, and even the rest of the world? Because they're now a huge major player. You know, one of your charts showed you know China is now becoming one of the big th- you know yeah, almost a, a third of the world economy. Well, yeah. So they're they they do uh, manufacture a lot of goods there, but things are slowing. I mean, mm-hmm. A number of years ago, they were at double digit growth. Now they're uh, high single digits, and now more recently, they're in the mid single digits, mm-hmm. um, and and continuing to slow. Why is that? Well, this is what happens to emerging economies that have, you know, grow, rapidly grow start so to fast, grow. Yeah. And in large part, it's the story of productivity. Um, when you when you don't have a lot of capital and you, you, you're not being very productive, clearly, when you have your choice of what to do, you're going to pick the low hanging fruit. Mm-hmm. And and so you begin to buy that initial equipment that can boost activity just tremendously. Um, uh, classic photo from China that I use in my class that I teach at University of Chicago, uh, winter storm and there's uh, uh, snow along the highway and you know 20, 30 years ago China solved that by taking uh, 100 soldiers with shovels and putting them out there in uniform sure. shoveling off the highway. Of course today all you need to do is just give any one of those individuals a truck with a plow on it and they'll be you know a thousand times more productive than, them, yeah. than all of them combined. Sure. Um, so. Uh, it's 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 having that in investment that takes place that you get those amazing gains. But as you get bigger and bigger, those technologies have a smaller and smaller impact. Mm-hmm. So productivity growth slows. Uh, so ultimately, all economies uh, underlying growth trends are based on labor force growth, mm-hmm. which is not going to be positive for China because the one child per household is having a material effect on seeing actual population declining mm-hmm. in China. Uh, and they're going to have a, you know, we talk about our aging population, they're going to have an aging population on steroids mm-hmm. uh, because of the, the one child per household is guaranteed that population goes down because there's no immigration into China from outside. At least one thing helping the United States, which has slow native births, which still is positive, uh, is the fact that half of our population growth is immigration. Uh, China doesn't have that. So they're going to be looking at population going down, which will be a drag on their GDP growth. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then with uh, productivity slowing down. You, t- you talk about the type of investments that take place. Well, in the United States, we don't have a czar that kind of makes those decisions. Right. We try not to. Certainly, there are times that we've had these green revolutions where we're going to invest all this money into these technologies and that's what we call industrial policy mm-hmm. when the better you know the government decides where they want to put investments it doesn't have great results you look at the stuff that was done during the you know Obama administration let's say you know Solyndra and Battery A123 all these companies went bankrupt mm-hmm. in fact China bought many of them 
uh, pennies on the dollar. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, so, but when you look at the Chinese economy, their investments were not decided by the market. Right. It was also decided by these people who are very smart people, mm -hmm. but we had very smart people doing it too, and it didn't turn out very well. So you begin to worry about how much of those investments are actually not profitable. Um, Warren Buffett, uh, I remember him using this great expression about you don't know who's swimming naked until the tide goes out. <laughs> and I think the slowing growth in China is going to be that receding tide. Yeah. That's going to reveal a lot more. You know, now the, the big news is Huawei and, and uh, you know, they're maybe being used as an example of, of what not to do. Uh, you know, our government's starting to crack down on, on, on this, you know, you can't keep stealing our technology forever. Is, it, is that, where are we at with that? What's, what's, well, I, I think what's happening here? Well, I, I absolutely think it's a very important and legitimate uh, issue to be brought up and to be pretty strong about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is theft. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, if, uh, if, 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 uh, if a country is not playing fair, uh, you know, they need to, this needs to be addressed. And you could either address it through, you know, they're part of the WTO and uh, World Trade Organization and bring it up through there, or, you know, we're going a little bit more unilaterally and, and, and trying to be more aggressive with some of these, you know, uh, trade agreements, mm -hmm. uh, you know, bilateral trade agreements. So interesting that, that the trade talks are happening at the same time that the Huawei, you know, mess is, is, is hitting the fan at the same time. So uh, very, very interesting strategic moves, perhaps, uh, by someone. <laughs> I know. Don't, don't have the, the vision to see who, but uh, a lot of very interesting things happening. So, so America, you know, a couple of things, you know, over, you know, we're, we're a, a nation of entrepreneurs. You know, the, the immigrants, you know, came in as, as entrepreneurs, the people who left, you know, for a better life, you know, over the last 100, 150 years more. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, huge amounts of money going into R and D. You know, the, the war efforts. You know, created all this. You know, stimulus in the in the uh, manufacturing sector. Uh, you know, intellectual property generation has become huge. You know, American universities. You know, became the best in the world. Um, where is this going in the next ten years? Are we are we looking to? You know, it, it seems like we still have the edge. A lot of other parts of the world are working really hard to catch up to us. Right. Um, what's happening here? And I think that I think the rest of the world. Catching up to us is great. Mm -hmm. I think it is too. Um, you know, and, and, and competition com is a good thing. Competition. <laughs> you know, and I, I was a young economist, and you know, when we had the whole issue with the input quotas that were going on uh, with the with the vehicles in the early '80s and stuff, I was talking to one of my contacts uh, in manufacturing, and you know, I kind of made the point about that. You know, well, you should be happy with the uh, import restrictions. It's making you know. Uh, competition, you know, less for you. Know, no, I, I love competition. Yeah. Competition keeps me globally competitive, uh, and it's not not easy. Keep you sharp, but it, but it keeps. But long run, it's what keeps me viable. And sure. I kept that message throughout my career, um, and 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 so uh, the, the 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 competition aspect of trade becomes very very important. We are still investing a very, very large and consistent share of our GDP in R&D. Yes. And increasingly done by the private sector. Uh, about you know, two thirds, three quarters of our R&D is by the private sector. So it's gonna, it's gonna have some very valuable, you know, market oriented type of results. Um, and the fact that other countries are also doing a lot of that, you know, is going to mean that we maybe don't have to be spending quite as much to get some of the results. Um, as an example, I've got a sailboat. It's got beautiful wood on it. Mm. And varnishing it is very expensive and very time consuming. Mm -hmm. um, there is a product out there which you comes off looking like varnish but is far more durable than varnish. It was not invented in the United States, mm. it was invented in Europe. The very fact that they did the R&D and they came up with, but I'm able to purchase it, makes At a reasonable my cost. Make, it was like we didn't have to invent it, and it sure. makes my life a lot better. Sure. So I think of, and 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 I kind of pose this to my class at University of Chicago, uh, where you know we talk about some of these growth economics, and I'm like, the U.S. was the economy of the last century. 
that performance, did it come at the expense of countries around the world, or did we benefit countries around the world? And, it seems and like it would benefit it clearly the entire benefits. world economy. You <laughs> think you think about the fact of the rising of, tide of rises our, all boats of our of our some of our inventions, such as drug resistant crops. Where it used to be when I was younger, mm. you would hear about famine mm. in India, oh, yeah. uh, Biafra, uh, and so it was. It was uh, Bangladesh. You you would have you know all 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 of these horrible things. You don't hear about that anymore. You see global philanthropy from you know from some of the you know the captains of industry today. They're going out trying to solve some of the the problems in right. Africa with with disease and and and, uh, and food supply. Well, the Bill but, Gates Foundation but, 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 and others. Yeah, but I'm, not, I'm, I'm saying that, and that's wonderful. But I'm just also pointing out that some of the products that we produce mm -hmm. has allowed some of these uh, people to just purchase. Not even just, we're not gifting some of this up there. It's available to them, and they're able to purchase it. And it, it, it solves a lot of their uh, major catastrophes mm -hmm. that they were dealing with uh, in the past. So I was thinking um, in terms of economic success being being uh, exactly. poured into the rest of the Ex world as well. Exactly you know? right. Yeah. Exactly. So, you you mentioned that you know that we've been the economy of the last century. Uh, here here in the last ten years, as you pointed out in your talk, uh, you know we've we've had a trend of growth, um, maybe a record setting trend and expansion in, in terms of the sl in terms of the slowness of it. Well, well in terms of the duration, you mean? Yeah, the duration of the yeah. of uh, you know the the positive economy, I would say. Yeah. Right. So. You know, there there tends to be a lot of cycles, and you know, you, you see this over and over in the economy. You look at, you know, you look at the the sawtooth. You know, we're you would think we're sort of at the end of a trend now, um, but it maybe doesn't seem like that's really happening. You're you're you gave us a very positive forecast. Today. I, I give you a positive forecast because how long can we maintain this? What's the uh, you tell me when the next uh, negative economic <laughs> shock happens? So yes, you right. know, I made the point that right. uh, economies just do not run out of steam. There was nothing that I spoke to the group this morning about that left them feeling so good that they're yeah. going to go back to their offices, put their feet up on their desks, and say, you know, I've made enough money. Yeah, I yeah, can right. just I can just chill. Um, we grow. We grow by that roughly two percent rate, but it's when something happens. This so negative. I was asking the question shock. about China. You know, right? And and China, perhaps and, is a negative and, shock. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and you know, China has been on my radar as the number one place to be concerned about. Mm. Um, I'm not forecasting it, but I'm. I, I think that you're watching. It. I'm watching it very, and it's it's very hard to forecast. If even if it's, you say this is the most likely event to happen, when it happens. Um, and that's why we call it shocks because sure. they're kind of unanticipated. Right. And, I, and I say China because, again, I like markets to organize my activity, and China has not pursued that approach. Right, right. Um, and so I think there will be a time where things come to pay, and there's going to be some challenges with this non market oriented, uh, quasi capitalistic type of economy. Um, but we continue to grow. And I think that short of having one of these negative economic shocks, I have no reason to believe that growth doesn't continue out. In fact, the latest uh, summary of economic projections by the Fed, uh, 17 policymakers provided their outlook all the way through 2021, and they see you know impressive growth for 2018 when we finally get that fourth quarter value of around three percent. Uh, growth moderating to you know around two and a half percent or a bit under that. Uh, this year in 2019, but then going out into 2020 and 2021 growth that's roughly around trend, this 1.8 to 2 percent growth rate. Personally, I'm really happy with that kind of growth. I mean, it, the longer it goes, the better it is. And the very fact that it has been the most modest expansion that we have seen has led to a situation when you look across the United States, the real side of our economy, we don't have the imbalances, much like. You know, we were very concerned about the housing market, uh, and as it built itself into a bubble. Uh, and right. when that bubble burst, it took down not just the housing market, but the entire financial market related to the mortgage industry and beyond. Um, so, when you look around the economy today, we don't have any of these jackrabbiting sectors. A few years ago, people were talking about the automotive sector mm -hmm. because sales had really skyrocketed. We said. A record in terms of vehicle sales in 2015. We topped that in 2016. And then there's a lot of concern about are we being too aggressive, giving money out? It's going to be the next subprime hmm. uh, crisis. Hmm. Well, in fact, sales 
have been moderated. Moderated. It's yeah. been relatively flat. And in fact, uh, even with a growing economy, uh, the expectation is from the industry as well as some of the uh, watchers of the industry. Blue Chip, for example, sees vehicle sales uh, slowing this year and next year. Uh, so even with an economy growing at trend or even above trend, they see that pulling back. Sure. So my point is, is that it's hard to find a sector that appears to be out of balance, that needs to adjust lower because they've gotten too hot. Uh, and I think that puts us less at risk domestically for one of these type of corrections. So that's why when I think about the risk, uh, my eyes are absolutely looking beyond the borders of the United States. Mm -hmm. China uh, can't ignore what's going on in Europe between Brexit, which has some issues, but, uh, but certainly concerns about is it going to be another country that might think about leaving the EU, mm -hmm. whether it's Italy, Spain, they talk about Greece. Uh, maybe one leaving the eurozone, which hasn't happened yet, mm -hmm. uh, and and so sort uh, of chaotic factors that are happening right. around and we, the and we know and we know the fact that those, uh, as we saw it during the financial crisis in the United States, it was severe here, but it was severe all around the world. Sure, those financial issues travel in nanoseconds around the world. The world is is truly becoming flat, <laughs> at least on the financial <laughs> side. M money seems to be able to. Uh, uh, travel very rapidly and move and shift around the world very rapidly. And I don't mean flat, you know, from the flat earther sense. Right. I'm talking about flat from the sense of, of you know, we're becoming so much we're more very connected. Yes. We're very so much interconnected. So, so given that we're in a, you know, a, a modest growth trend, what what do you see as the couple of uh, perhaps biggest challenges that that we have? I was going to ask this for the manufacturing sector, but really for the U.S. economy as a whole so I, in the next decade. Yeah, so, so uh, and, and that's a great question because it's kind of uh, so much of what I do and what the Fed tends to do is focus on what we call the medium term or even yeah. near term, you know, the next two or three years. And you're talking about 2021. That's right. only a couple of years away. Right. right. It sounds like it's really far, but, uh, you know, <laughs> 2020 isn't. is less than a year away now. That's right. Um, so uh, when, when we think about longer term, or when I think about longer term, uh, probably my number one concern is whether or not we're going to have the workforce that is mm. going to be capable of doing the work that will be needed. In this transitioning economy and, and sectors that are rising, sectors that are contracting, uh, are we going to be able to get, make sure that we have the skilled workers to do the jobs that will need it to be done? Um, and, or will we have workers that will not be able to engage? Mm. That is important not just for output gain, growth, but for the stability of an economy, mm. the stability of a society, uh, to make sure that people are, are fruitful and, and successful in that economy. I'm worried about that. Um, education I, is one of those really interesting places that, you know, it was yeah. our education system was created 150 years ago. Right. And a lot of talk about this. Right. Like, and, what and are we going to do about and it? We, and we pushed a lot of people to go get a college education. Mm -hmm. And yeah. not, not, not all of it was truly college type of education. Some of it uh, might not be as valuable. Uh, and I think we, in the past, we kind of discounted some of the t more technical type of training. Sure. And there's a lot of good jobs out there that you don't need to get a four year degree. Uh, to be successful. And, and self-education these days is even becoming much more viable with the rise of the internet and you know right. schools like MIT and Stanford right. opening Offering up their up. curriculum you know right. Right. so that anybody can learn it. You don't have to go to school. You don't right. have to go and pay the you know the, 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 the huge uh, tuitions. Right. Right. So, so that's number one and uh, say on top of that I, I get a very nervous about the amount of debt that uh, mm -hmm. we're building up as a society. Mm -hmm. um, as a share of our publicly held debt, we're about a little over 80 percent. That's doubled from what it was 10, 10 12 years ago. Yeah. Um, and so whenever you run debt, it's basically saying that we're going to spend now and consume less later or have it paid for later. So that's another burden I think that we're leaving on future generations is the possibility that uh, this debt will, will, will need to be dealt with to some degree. Hmm. Debt, yes. That is a that is a horrible thing. <laughs> so, the obvious flip side of that question is: What's our biggest opportunity in the next decade? Where you know what's the what's the real bright spot? 
Um, so the, the real bright spot is the fact that um, we have one of the most flexible economies and systems uh, in the world. Mm -hmm. um, we allow two very bad things to occur. Uh, you know, and I often in some of my comments to my students at the uh, University of Chicago I talk about how unemployment is good and bankruptcy is good. <laughs> you know, these are two evils that are very horrible and have impacts on on people and businesses that are quite severe and and, 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 and just not good. But these are necessary evils. Uh, the ability of having the creative destruction that Joseph Schumpeter would talk about, where you could evolve your economy so that we move from having an agrarian economy to a manufacturing economy to now one that is more service-based, uh, and making sure that your service uh, workers are skilled workers so they can receive the compensation that will give to you know, a good livelihood for them. Um, and you know, it's not all just people working at McDonald's. There's right. a tremendous amount of uh, wonderful jobs that are available, but you need to be uh, in a knowledge-based economy. You need to have knowledge. Yes. And we need to make sure and that skills. those people have the knowledge and skills to be uh, successful. So, um, so, I th so I think that is just some great opportunities there. This um, ability to tear down and, and, and build up again, re right. rebirth. Right, and the fact that we're not going to keep up an industry around that is just not viable into the future, that we mm -hmm. allow bankruptcy law to transition that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for example, uh, you know, the energy sector. We had this, this new technology, hydraulic fracture, fracturing and horizontal drilling became very popular very quickly. Uh, oil prices were shooting up in the early part of this decade, reaching $107 a barrel. Took it right down. And, and, and people were, were, were taking contracts out and saying, oh, we can develop this and it's viable at $60 a barrel. And then all of a sudden the market collapsed in 2014. Uh, and prices plummeted down mm -hmm. to below thirty dollars a barrel. Well, a lot of those industries wound up going bankrupt mm -hmm. because they had put in an expected cost to be covered by a much higher price. Sure. But the bankruptcy allowed another participant to come in, buy those assets at a fraction of the original price, and all of a sudden that sixty dollar price for profitability was reduced down to a much lower price. So with that reevaluation, those businesses were able to come in and redevelop and bring it back up at maybe forty dollars a, a barrel. Uh, so now when it's trading at fifty one dollars, those are profitable ventures compared to if it you know had been originally developed sure. at a sixty dollar price point. It's a very very entrepreneurial spirit right. following the, the process and, and making it work. Right. So so the, the you know America was founded on entrepreneurs and continue to be driven by entre the entrepreneurial spirit of the world. So, Absolutely. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for your time, Bill. We, we, we really appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you for the conversation. Thank you.